Okay, everybody knows that about the potato. I mention it. Um, it's nice. It's nice to share food and conversation with our viewers. And then we're going to, now we're going to have a conversation with your neighbor. Do you want to even step in? No, no. 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 I'm going to stay out of the Thank you, Grangers, Grangettes. Is that the right term? No. It is now. You're all Grangers and Grangettes. <laughs> anyway, four score and seven years ago. Um, that's the wrong one. Anyway, thank you for having me here. <laughs> uh, oh, it's my pleasure. Uh, this is being recorded, so if you don't want to be recorded, tough. Um, yeah, yeah, don't draw attention to yourself and we won't point the camera at you. So the theme is um, uh, how to garden in the wild, with wildlife. Um, how can we have a garden uh, in our environment here that is full of different creatures that like to come and eat the garden? Um, it's crucial, in my opinion, that what we do uh, is, uh, our, at least for us, is organic and safe to use. So the uh, things that I'm going to tell you about are all um, animal and pet friendly and safe. Um, I think some people don't take action when their plants are having problems because of past experiences with maybe things that didn't turn out the way they thought they would, or maybe an animal ate some of that bait and got sick or died, you know, those kinds of things. Well, the, the, the new things are out and, and new ways are out to combat the common garden uh, pests. And um, probably this year, the worst, I'll ask you, do you all have a garden? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, vegetables or just uh, a combo, ornamental vegetables? A little, bit, a little bit of everything. What is the number one pest this year? Aphids. Uh, well, maybe for you, but it hasn't been there. What? Deer. deer. Well, deer are always, yes. Uh, this year, because uh, the deer seem to be steady. They seem like they're always a pest. For me, at least, this year, the, the big pest is the earwings. I was just going to say that. Right? right? We don't think about them because we don't see them. Uh, they come out at night. They're nocturnal. And uh, <laughs> I'm not laughing at my, my poor customers, but I can't tell you how many people have lost their gardens. I mean, completely lost them because the plants were just devoured. And, and by the time they see the plants being eaten uh, and take, to try to take action, it's too late. And, and they don't know why the plants are missing. You know, uh, we see this all, all the time. <laughs> all the time. I move around a lot, by the way. So it's hard to stay in one spade. But um, people will, uh, you know, I think the deer ate them. Or did rabbits do this? Or, and it, usually the last thing is earwigs. And they are the worst I've seen this year than uh, all the years in the past. And they must be treated for. You gotta, you gotta treat for them. And I know there's a million and one home remedies. My mom used to roll up newspapers. They'd crawl in them. Then you'd burn the paper. But that's not good around here. This is somewhere else. Um, beer, little trays of beer, they, they would crawl in and, and drown. But um, I need something that, that works more effectively and quicker. So what I'm recommending, it's the only one I know of that's safe. It's the Sluggo Plus. I use this in the nursery all the time. And I just flip it open. And it's got a little shaker. And I shake it around, around my plant. I do it right when I plant. and. Um, what makes it safe is the way it kills the, the earwigs through bacteria. It's a bait. It's like a little BB. And so when you sprinkle it around and, and it goes into, onto the ground, uh, it attracts them. When they come out at night, uh, they go to the little bait and they eat the bait. And what kills the earwig is a bacteria that is only effective against them. So when your cat or the dog decides he's interested in the little bait you threw out there and eats it, the bacteria that kills those bugs doesn't harm the pet. And that's the number one reason why I think people don't use um, we, we, uh, earwigs, slug, and snail baits. They're concerned about. Uh, what about chickens or other birds? No, no problem. 
There, it is an OMRI certified, it's an Organic Material Review Institute. Um, they're, they, they, it kills uh, slugs and snails. And, but the way it kills them is through iron phosphate. It's an overdose of iron, if you will. So there's two things in the bait. There's iron phosphate to kill the slugs and snails, and a bacteria to kill earwigs. Yes? Is it only the plush that's safe for animals? I think I've noticed. Well, no, all of sluggos are, are safe, but you've got to get the plus, because that's for earwigs. There's also a sluggo that's just called sluggo, and it's for slugs and snails. That's great on the coast. But here in the inland area, our biggest pest is earwigs. It's, it's always earwigs and then slugs and snails. So that's why I, I get that plus. And, you know, we plant our, our vegetables, and I'm, that day I put the bait out, and then I'll put it out again. So this is one of those new kinds of uh, pest controls that's a very, very safe to use. And Yes? Does the iron phosphate in there act as a supplement when you're placing it extra iron? That I don't think there's enough in it to make a difference. But the main thing is, it won't hurt. And the worst case scenario, it might give them a tummy ache, but it's not going to hurt your pets, chickens, and other um, kids. <laughs> you know, look, mommy, I collected these BBs, and I'm eating them. Um, and along those lines um, of new kinds of controls for pests um, in the bacterias, <clears throat> mosquitoes, are coming out, okay? You all know about mosquito dunks, right? Does anybody not know about mosquito dunks? Good, somebody doesn't know. <clears throat> They've been around for a while, actually, but you take one of these little dunks and you throw it in your neighbor's pond because they're not doing anything about the mosquitoes. And I didn't say to do that. But, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you throw it over there in their pond and those little dunks, these little floaty things float in the water and they dissolve over a period of 30 days. They release a bacteria in the water. This bacteria is only effective against mosquito larvae and gnats. Okay? So the koi, you know, your $10,000 koi that you've got in the pond, you've, you've got the, kept the egrets away, the eagles away. Um, uh, you, you can put this in there and it won't harm the fish, but it kills the mosquito larvae. Yes, sir. You can also put it in a horse truck. Hor it's totally safe. I mean, I, I would, of course, put it in any kind of human uh, water, but a horse trough, um, old tires. Well, well, because it doesn't say that, OK? It's safe for most animals. Um, animal watering troughs, bird baths, flower pots. Do not use in human, uh, it doesn't say that, but anyway, I wouldn't use it. But these are, the, these are the cool kinds of pest controls that we have that sometimes people don't know about. And it's amazing because they, they work and they're safe. Okay, um, the other thing that is important right now, and in, in I've seen a lot of folks that aren't doing it, uh, fruit trees, okay, they planted their fruit trees and <clears throat> Here's a plum. It's a peach of a plum. <laughs> no, I'll, you know, it's a peach of a plum. Um, it's not a peach plum. It's just a plum. I was so excited. I know. <laughs> Very interesting, but stupid. Does that date me? Yeah. OK. <laughs> uh, fruit trees right now, you got to make sure. The one thing. Um, uh, Living in, in with wild wildlife and, and out here in the country, another concern would be the the sun burning our plants and whatnot. And the number one reason why fruit trees die is because we don't paint the trunks white. Okay, this is something every Granger and Grangeette should know about when you're planting your trees at your ceremonies and stuff. Uh, fruit trees, and the reason is. People say, well, why do you have to paint the, the trunks? Well, if, if you grow a, a, a fruit tree from a seedling, it has low branches. And it grows up like, like a lot of trees do, and they shade their trunk. But in the nursery business, we graft trees and, and grow them to be a certain way. And, and a lot of folks want, of course, a trunk on them. So a lot of times, the lower branches are removed. So this exposes that trunk to the hot sun. The number one reason, I think the number one reason why fruit trees fail the first or second year after they've been planted, people fail to protect the trunk from sunburn. And what happens is 
with this trunk on the southwest side, it'll burn. Every it's July and August, the sun hits the ground and it bounces off the ground and it hits the side of the trunk and eventually it can create a wound. Really the same way your skin. I mean, if you just leave your arm out in the sun and don't put any protection on it, after a while you're going to get burns and, and, and injuries. And just like your arm, it can be in a, a place for infection to come. But in this case, what happens is when these tr trees burn, they get a borer. They get a, a bug that lays an egg in there and you get worm that goes into the trunk of the tree and kills the tree. Because it's, it's entering through that sun-scalded area. So you wonder why you see orchards that are painted white. It's because this exposed trunk needs to be protected with the, the paint and reflect the light so that the tree can grow and get a nice big canopy on it that will eventually shade that trunk, but it's a young tree. So it's kind of a thing you do while the tree is young, although some farmers will continue the practice all the way uh, for the rest of the life of the tree. They don't want to take a chance. So um, I use a white latex mixed with water. I, I whitewash it, and every, every year I put it back on the, the trunk uh, to reestablish it and make sure that the sun won't burn the trunk. Or I buy this tree wrap, we've been selling this stuff, it's like an ace bandage, but it's white. And you'll take it and you'll just start rolling it around the trunk. And then at the top, you just tuck it in and it's white and it reflects the sunlight. But something as simple as not, I mean, you can go and buy 10 fruit trees, plant them out. And then two years later, you're coming back to me going, my tree, what's happened? They'll, they'll typically they'll bring their dead tree in and, and show it to me. And I'll go down by the trunk and Sure enough, on the southwest side, it's all burnt up. And sometimes you can pull the bark away and you see little sawdust in there. Sawdust from the boar that went in. And what a waste. I mean, two years of, of wasted effort. Yes? Does that happen with like Japanese maples too? Uh, typically, no, because they're more in the shade. And a lot of times, they have lower branches. So they're, they're shading. See, a pomegranate, as an example, has branch is low. I, I don't need to paint the trunk. It protects itself with its own leaves. It's these other fruit trees that are taller up that have that exposed trunk. Yes? We have a maple, it's not, well, we have a lot of Japanese maples, but there's one thing the maple, it's a green, large green maple. About this much down before the dirt. It looks like elements. It's like totally just cracked and like it's not to be off and Looks yeah, but it's in the sun. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It sounds like that could be an issue. You know, we used to sell these beautiful weeping Japanese maples. I mean, big mm -hmm. ones, and people would put them out in a little bit too much sun, and they wouldn't notice it because up on the top part of the tree, there's no leaves, and these big branches would be, and they'd get exposed to the sun, and it kill the tree. And they'd bring this tree back in. This is years ago when we had thousand dollar Japanese maples. And they'd bring them back and they'd go, what happened to my tree? And you'd crawl up there and you could peel the bark away. And sometimes under the bark it'd be sawdust. And it's because that, that wood was exposed up there to the sun. So that's why, like Japanese maples, you got to make sure on those, those uh, as they grow up that, you know. But that's usually only on the weeping ones. Yes. Every year they it's just going to grow back worse. Well, well, yeah, Davy Tree and those kind of companies are usually working on, you know, for the power companies and stuff, yeah. and they're not as these are. This is a different kind of a, a pruning method and a different way. And, and you tell them. Okay. <laughs> they got a shredder. You ever seen Fargo? The end episode? Yeah. Well, don't forget, they got shredders. These Davy Tree trucks are driving all over them. <laughs> you betcha. Um, oh, the other, th <laughs> the other thing, um, that, that, uh, another pest, um, I'll give, I'm just going to test you, see if you know. Another pest that uh, is, uh, is common around here would be scared away with this. Birds. Yeah, I don't know if people remember this stuff, but you'll see it in the vineyards and whatnot, in orchards. It's um, this, this silver metallic tape stuff, and you wrap it on your plants, and it shimmers. 
in the light and scares the birds away. We hang CDs too. That's the old school method. People that still have CDs that are really old school, <laughs> that actually still have <laughs> CDs around. I mean, hang your VHS in there too. <laughs> No, they are. It's a shimmering, and she's right. We used to hang the CD, and they, they do work. Um, but you know, this is a more like yard more available. Um, but yeah, the shimmering does uh, scare. It does help to scare the birds. But like, we've got some blueberries at the nursery. We've been cultivating in cans, and they're getting the berries are starting to get blue. And I know the blackbirds and, and the the blue jays are watching these things. They've been. Yeah hanging up there. And I've even seen them talking. You know, birds that flock together, the blue jays and the blackbirds are working together, I think. Yeah, yeah, but they don't let you know that. So they're watching the blueberries. And I do want to make sure that you also know that we have, and you can easily put on year after year, some bird netting. So I, we did both. OK, so what we did is we got the blueberry plant. This is a pomegranate, but pretend it's a blueberry. And she put some stakes in it around the container. We hung some of uh, the silver tape on the top, and then we've wrapped it with the netting. Uh, yeah, it's a lot of work, but I want blueberries. So for the birds, I mean, there's really only two methods to keep, to keep them out, and that's the, the netting, a physical barrier, or that shimmering tape. Sometimes the tape will work on its own. But the blueberries, I'm not going to trust it. Yeah, not this year. <clears throat> The other thing we can do, oh, oh, this, I got all sorts of fun stuff. This is um, for wet pest. Ah, yes. The way it works is you wear it. <laughs> and then you attack, then you attack the gophers. And then when they jump at you and claw you with your teeth, they won't be able to get through. <laughs> yes, it is. Um, he never made any money with it, but he is a genius. Uh, no, it's, a, it's, a, it's the new kind of gopher cage. It's actually something kind of cool. The, the old ones were much thicker metal, and they were a little harder to work with. But we've got these new ones that are much more flexible, and um, I wouldn't take a chance. Um, if you have gophers in, in activity in the yard, um, I would count on them coming over to your tree and plant and eating it. Um, Let's say an example, figs. You know, he came to the nursery, he said, is there anything I can grow outside that deer won't eat? That's a fruit. Figs. <laughs> no, yes. they don't. Not the, not the plant. They eat figs. Well, I'm looking over there at, at uh, hers. What? Well, yeah, but the deer, the figs, the, now, I'm looking at her fig, and the deer haven't eaten hers. And of course, what it, Oh, no, not the figs, the leaf. No, they don't eat the leaf. Aha, good. That's what I was getting at. Oh, no, no, the, the, all bets are off when it comes to the fruit. No, but you're looking for a... about the leaf, man. Well, you do if you want fruit, right? I mean, you can't have a tree with no leaves and just fruit. So we got to work together here. Um, so we... Yeah, so you guys are tough. So with the... So you've come to me and you said, hey, is there a tree that the deer won't eat the leaves? That's a fruit, a fig. I recommend a fig to you. <laughs> now, when the fruit, now when the fruit starts to get ripe, you're gonna have to do something about the deer. But one thing about fig trees, uh, gophers love figs. We, uh, yeah, they love figs. We just need a few of our cats. Yeah, well, <laughs> cats, cats sometimes work, sometimes they're lazy. I mean, everybody's cat's different, right? No, this is, what's that? If you have enough of them, you get a Well, yeah, but there's a limit to how many cats that we have at our place. So along with the cats, this is what I would use. I would definitely use one of these, like my fig tree. Well, you just dig the hole and, and put it in the hole, form it into the, the hole, and plant the tree in the cage. Yes, so now you've got a physical barrier in the ground. That w and it's, it's tough enough so when they come and start to bite at it. The idea being that once the tree starts growing and getting large enough that the roots will grow through it, the metal rots, and the tree's big enough to withstand the massive gopher attack that we saw in Caddyshack. <laughs> and that is based on a true story. <laughs> Beavers. <laughs> Beavers. <laughs> Um, yeah, I've got nothing for beavers. 
Arm uh, armadillos, mole max. Um, oh, um, the other uh, thing about um, wildlife and whatnot, of course, is to plant things that the deer don't eat. And uh, over the years, we have come up with a whole selection of plants, ornamentals mostly, but there are some fruits. Pomegranate is considered deer resistant. Uh, the fig we talked about. Fruits, though, fruits and vegetables mostly uh, have to be protected from the wild. And my thinking is that when we do our yards, our gardens, our, our properties, and we want to put ornamental plants in, uh, um, that's where we use the, the deer resistant type material. And then we enclose an area where we can have uh, fruit and edible crops um, because basically you've got to make a Fort Knox out of it with a fence and, and whatnot. So outside of that area that you've got fenced off from the deer, um, put plants in the deer don't eat. And I think over time people are starting to do that. When we first started in the nursery business, people insisted on planting roses constantly uh, because that's just what you did. But after a while, uh, people's uh, tastes change. I've noticed a lot of more interest now in things like ornamental grasses. You know, 20 years, 25 years ago, these weren't popular because it wasn't in. People hadn't seen what they could do, right? It's a perfect thing for those of us that have way too many barn cats around. <coughs> um, but yes, uh, typically the grasses the deer don't eat. Most of the grasses they'll leave alone. So there's a whole wealth of different types of grasses, different kinds of. Um, what's your experience with coleus? I do too. Now, have you ever planted it out to see if the deer would eat it? They don't like it. Ah, bingo. So there is another plant that is uh, uh, deer resistant. The coleus are really cool. Um, they've been coming out with all sorts of new colors lately. It's like, wow, I just can't believe the different. Um, they do best in the shade, don't they? Shade. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Oh, rabbits. Why did you bring them up? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Well, and of course, that's the problem with, with gardening in this our area. Is it, you know, we can work hard on the deer, and then the rabbit jumps in and eats the, <laughs> eats the thing. So you know what? It's just give up. I mean, <laughs> I tell you, it is hard gardening in the foothills. It is. Oh, it is hard. It is a challenge. And I don't like, I, and that's why I don't like, um, uh, uh, easy gardening or, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, no, no hassle or no problem gardening. You know, oh, you can do, no there's no such thing. It's a, like any good hobby. You, it, you get out of it what you put into it and there's a learning curve. Yes? How about falconry? Involved in what? Oh, for the pets. Yeah. There's something, there's a business opportunity <laughs> waiting for somebody. No, I'm serious. I mean, why not falcon? Why not what about sheep that eat the grass down? I'm surprised we don't have more people that, that run out there. Goats and yeah. Uh, falconry, there you go. There's a business for it. How much time do I got? Okay, just roll your eyes when you're tired. Succulents are a new thing, but I haven't noticed any like peacocks or cats or <laughs> Perfect lead off for me. Thank you. Succulents. And um, nice yeah, yeah, perfect. And they multiply, they take care of them. There's no bigger trend right now either than succulents yeah, because true. they are so easy to care for. Yeah. And there's such a wealth of different types. I mean, it's no longer just the old jade plant. There's a million different kinds, and we've been trying to find ones that will grow outside here in the cold. Well, and you, this hard. will grow here outside. It's a, well, it's hard it is zone seven. So it survives the seven. Yes, yes, and it's a, it's a succulent. Yeah, ours grow outside. Deer yeah, won't eat. Ones yeah, there, there's, yeah. A, there's different kinds. Succulent, I mean, I'm sure you guys know being uh, Grange folks that succulents are just those plants that have the, the fleshy leaves and right. all. But there's ground covers and uprights and different colors. But uh, we like them because one, they're low maintenance, and you know that's the uh, people less care. But th that's been the biggest change that I've seen over the last 15 or 20 years is more people are willing to experiment with shapes, colors, and form of plants rather than just flowers. 
I mean, I don't get me wrong, I love a big flower display, but it used to be a lot more flower oriented and color. Now we can use different things to get the same kind of effect. And yes, yeah, succulents, deer resistant, drought resistant, a uh, whole new varieties coming out all the time that are, uh, are fun. Monica likes to propagate them because they're easy. I mean, gosh, you take a leaf, drop it in some sand or perlite and give it some moisture and they grow. So uh, yeah, the succulents are definitely an area that we want to, uh, to, keep, to keep growing. <clears throat> Along the lines of succulents, euphorbia, anybody familiar with this? Um, there's a big one growing up by the IOF hall in Georgetown on the side. You'll see it, it gets these big um, yellow flowers that come out on the side. And if you ever uh, go up and pinch it or pinch one of these and you break a branch or a leaf, a white milky substance comes out, a, kind of a latexy type material. Deer hate it. Okay? Hardy in our zone. I mean, you look at it and go, well, what is this? Well, what happens is it gets these spikes that come out and it gets these green like panicle type flowers that come out. I mean, it's quite striking. And um, the one, like I said, the one I, I remember is up in Georgetown. But I mean, it's right on the, deer never bother these things. So um, euphorbias is another type of a plant that is um, deer resistant and has interest to it at certain times of the year. Ah, foxglove. What's the experience with the deer resistance on this? Good, good. Yeah, another plant that is a herb, flower, easy to grow, comes up every year. Um, great source of nectar for bees and elves. They come along and, and harvest and, and, and honey and uh, what's that? The elves, yeah, well, that's at night on a waning moon. A waning moon, on a waxing, waning, um, full and moon, you go out at night uh, dressed in your ceremonial garb and you will find <laughs> elves gathering the uh, nectar from the box club. But don't, <laughs> no guarantees. No, like any good hobby, it takes time and effort. Are the elves working on, what's that? You know, it's getting close, isn't it? Is it getting close? Um, okay. I don't want to keep you guys too long. Um, what else should I mention here? I have one quick question. Yes. It's not related to little plants, but can you know anything you can say about the plants that are not really good for spraying or anything you can spray or use on your big trees, like we have big oak trees that are getting mildew for the last two years? There's fungicides you could spray on them, but, but you'd have to get it on the whole tree. Yeah, so you've got to get a... Uh, well, but it's killing the leaves of the tree, so I'm not sure what you do about it. Typically, that mildew that the oaks get <clears throat> comes and goes every year, and it comes and goes in various, you know, like in some years it's worse. And this year, because I, I'm assuming because of the, mil the, the, the moisture, uh -huh. we had a long spring and all, I'm assuming it's worse. Yeah. And um, typically, I don't do anything, the tree heals itself. Okay. Um, yeah, you'd have to get the spray all over the tree. There's a danger with the peacock. I mean, there are sprays that I would think that wouldn't hurt uh, the peacocks. But again, you'd have to get it all through the whole tree. So my it's sort of that same thing, though. It, it's self-healing. It, yeah, yeah, it, it, it's sort of a natural. It's just sort of a pain in the butt because you're busy yeah. cleaning up yeah. leaves all your own. It's like the worms that hang from the tree. Yeah. Some years they're really bad. And then other years, you know, what happened? But yeah. I think the mildew is the same way. Well, we have good mildew and no worms, so maybe there's correlation. Yeah, and next year the worms will be back in the mildew. And then one year they'll have worms with mildew. <laughs> <laughs> when the worms have mildew, you know the end is near. <laughs> and because the end is near, it's probably a good idea to start eating honey. <laughs> Because, hey, what the heck, it's sweet and the end is near, right? So throw the diet out and eat honey. Um, I brought this strictly because uh, it had nothing to do with the program. Um, we've we're got honey. Yeah. Honey's back. Yes, we got honey. Uh, 2018 honey. Uh, we have 21 hives now. Yeah! 
Wow, we are, those bees that are at your yard pollinizing your flowers, those are ours. So that means you can't keep them. They have to fly back to us. And we get a share of whatever they're pollinizing. So peaches, peach cobbler, uh, peach pie, that kind of a thing. Um, and you'll recognize our bees because they have a little GG on them. They have a little... <laughs> You guys are great, man. <laughs> You're laughing at my stupidest things. Anyway, um, the, well, we call it wildflower. And this year, I'm thinking there's a, I will say that, man, they went after the scotch broom for the pollen. Like, I mean, we had a broom bloom this year. It was unbelievable. So the, the reason our pollen is, the reason our honey is good is we don't move the hives. They stay there. The bees collect only flowers that they can come and fly to. So if you're looking for allergy prevention uh, uh, part of the honey, we've got it. It's local. We don't ship the hives somewhere else. They stay here. So like when they were out going after the pollen on the, on the scotch broom, those are those people who are allergic to scotch broom. There's, there's broom pollen in here. and that's got, It's not enough of it to cause you to get a reaction, but hopefully enough if you eat it over time that you can build an immunity. No scientific evidence I can't point to, but I have tried my honey now for the last couple of years. And this year I did get allergies, but they never have been as bad as I used to get before I started doing the honey. But that's enough of the medical part. It's just delicious. It's wildflower, and then that uh, really started coming in. Uh, we started to be able to collect when the blackberries bloom. Around here, for us, it's blackberry time. Yeah. But, but to be able to call it blackberry honey, it, the bees would have to have 90% blackberries. And our bees go everywhere. They, they, like I say, they, they will go to up to five miles. So they are coming to your, your place and, 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 and getting, and then the, they, so they get the pollen. I, I was asking Dave, the beekeeper, I said, um, gee, Dave, why don't we have some honey? I, I know they're coming back with the, the, the pollen from the, uh, the broom, because you can see the bodies are covered with yellow. So said, well, that's pollen. They, they need nectar. See, they need nectar to make the honey. So we had to wait until there was enough nectar, and that's the blackberries. Mm -hmm. and, now, and also right now, clover, mm -hmm. the fields yeah. that have clover on them. You'll see the bees going there. And then the last chance for honey collection would be the star thistle, star thistle honey. Is that but, why they call the honey clover honey? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, it, but to get it to be a clover honey, they would set their hives out in a field that for two miles out this direction was all clover. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they, that exists because they take them out to, to pollinize and stuff. And then you'd have clover honey. Um, orange blossom honey, for instance. It, would be, it has to sit in a, where you know the bees have gone to almost only orange blossoms. But because ours go to every different flower, we call it wildflower honey. But um, I did want to mention it because it's so good. And how much is it? Uh, 20 bucks. It's 20 bucks a pint. And I, and I, you know, I, I go out and we, we, do, we do price honey. I like that, you know, it's something we sell, so we go out and check it out. So I go to the supermarkets to see what the pricing is. And uh, I also talk to other beekeepers. And my feeling is that we're way undercharging for honey. <clears throat> for the amount of work that goes into producing a jar of honey, for the work that the beekeeper has to do. Now, see, that, but the problem is beekeepers, like a lot of trades, they think they, they don't get hip with it too quick. And so they're thinking like old school. And, and the thing is, when, when Bert got started with Bert's Bees, it was different. You got a hive, you put a hive out, nothing happened to it. The hive would grow and you'd get another and you'd get another. And maybe once in a while you'd lose a hive. Nowadays, typically you lose 10 to 20% of your hives every year. So the beekeeper has to replace them. Now, about the bee apocalypse. Okay, it's a big concern with the native bees. The native bees. The honeybee is actually growing in population. There are actually more hives now out there because of beekeepers. You know, honeybees are the domesticated bee. And so we can create more hives, we can divide them, we can just keep, you know, we lose one hive, we can build two more. And through that effort, uh, the beekeepers have increased the number of hives. And so that's been a good thing. But the problem is you lose 10 to 20% of your hives every year, and that's got to be replaced. And the way I look at it is a jar of this honey will last me if I take a spoonful out every day, and Monica takes a spoonful out every day. This will last me for, gosh, weeks. Two six-packs of Scrimshaw beer, if you add it up, will cost you 20 bucks. And you and your friends will drink that in one night. 
So why is it that beer makers can charge that for their beer, but honey people sit around going, well, I can only get $8 or $10 for it. Or no, we can get more for it because it's a valuable product. And uh, to be honest, we sold out of it last year at that price. And I, I, I don't want to compete on price with my honey because it's a unique product. Matter of fact, it can't be compared to anything. There is no other local honey like this. So, you know, you can say, well, gee, I could, there's, I saw that Subi honey in the store. Subi honey, have you ever looked at that stuff? It doesn't even look like honey. It's that stuff you get at the restaurant. So, um, um, what is it that people call um, I don't know them, but uh, I do know that there's, if, if it's called orange blossom honey, then it's not local honey. We don't have orange blossom growth. They do move their hives. Most, most bee places move their hives. They, they'll take them, okay, the, 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 the orchard's blooming, so they take them down to Sacramento, they put them in a, in a hive uh, orchard, they get the pollen from it. Oh, somebody needs some bees over here, we go over there. And that's a, a legitimate thing. But if you're collecting orange blossom and uh, um, ash or whatever else, and it's not the stuff that you live amongst, then the medicinal quality of the local honey is lost. And, and the assumption is, and I, is that when you buy local, you're buying honey that will help you with the allergen concerns. Yeah. <clears throat> so local is a, a loaded term. And it's a hip term, so everybody can say it's, oh, well, Rayleigh's, you know, locally produced. What does that mean? 100 miles from Rayleigh's, there are farms. Yeah, what is local? Um, I know with our honey, it's, it's, it's Garden Valley honey. Yay. Yes, yes. And I've heard their honey's delicious. <laughs> I'm not raising the price, no, no. We're holding it steady. It's a, it's a, <clears throat> it's a medicine. And you know what those pharmaceutical companies are doing with their medicine? We're holding our price. And our medicine's sweeter. Remember what Mary Poppins said? Just a spoonful of honey makes them... That's what they were originally going to put in the song, but they changed it. The sugar lobby. Yes. <laughs> yeah, we, we, um, we actually sell bees. Uh, I'll, I'll leave you with this. Um, we, we had started a little bee shop at the nursery. Now, most of you know because you see it, but if you haven't been in it a little bit, uh, we've got a section now where we sell beehives, bee equipment to start a, um, your own hives. And it's worked. It's worked out. It would be fun. Yes, all the puns. Once you get involved in honey, and the puns come uh, rapidly. And so. Uh, Do we just call you to come harvest it when it's ready? Well, um, uh, no, not me. Uh, we'll call you UPS Dave. Yeah, well, Dave, Dave, uh, the old UPS driver, Dave, is our beekeeper. Um, and he is the old UPS driver, because every time I see him, he's over the road. How's retirement, Dave? I've never worked so hard. His replacement looks just like him. His replacement, but he's half as friendly and he drives way too fast. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, Dave does the beekeeping for us, and uh, we're going to be harvesting some more honey, and uh, it is the best honey around. And so if you're looking for local honey, and you know, or you know somebody that wants it, um, we've, got, we've got that. Um, is there, are there any other questions? Yes, yes, we do. Uh, we, did the, we did a bee class uh, in January, and it was, we're going to do that every year. We're going to do the bee class every year. Um, I don't have any classes planned for the summertime because typically it's a slow time of year. You know, school gets out. As a matter of fact, that's what we've noticed. When business starts, I mean, you can time it to school. As soon as the school gets out, business drops because the kids are home. Now suddenly mom doesn't have time to work in the garden. Everybody wants to go on vacation. So summertime is uh, a smooth sailing. Classes are always better in the um, fall or winter. You know, you're sitting at home bored. What am I going to do? Oh, that class down at the nursery. Oh, I wouldn't normally go, but I'm going to go nap some board at home, you know. So, <laughs> so we, will do more, we will do more bee classes, for sure. And uh, we have the bee stuff, so if you're ever interested or you know somebody that has shown an interest in beekeeping, we can get you started with it, get, get you off uh, on, on a good uh, run with that. What else is going on? Fill you in. Eh, that's about, yes. So um, I have a question. Um, if my vegetable plants bloom and then the flowers fall off and I don't get any fruit. Is that is are, bees? are we talking tomatoes? Tomatoes, squash. squash. 
typically this time of year it's the weather. Uh, tomato plants, they will drop the flower, the flower will not produce if the temperature drops below 55 at night or goes above 95 during the day. What did we just have? Heat. Those days, those fruit drop off. So that's with tomatoes. That's, it's kind of a weird thing. But like if you go to bed, if we went to bed tonight and the temperature dropped to 53, well, there went those flowers. There'll have to be a few more now and then the next day. You know. So that's why it waits till summer to really start producing. So in the beginning, when we have these temperature fluctuations, it's not uncommon. And really all you do, patience. Although I do, there's a trick. Take, go up to the flower of the tomato. Of course, if your flowers on your tomato are this big, Come see me, there's something wrong. <laughs> but you go up to the little flower, the little yellow flower, and just flick it. Yeah, shake mine. Uh, shake it. Yeah. yeah. It, it, it helps to dislodge the pollen that's in the... Um, uh, um, tomatoes are not... Uh, tomatoes, the bees will go to them, but they're not actually doing the pollen. They're shaking the flower, and it's, that's how they get... Um, yeah. Yeah, they, the bees have a manual that they're... In, they, they read. Yes. My spaghetti squash, not so much the other squash or the other zucchinis, same thing, but my spaghetti squash, all the plants, one in a big pot, one in the ground, um, are getting really yellow all of a sudden. Not a all over the sun. Um, a lack of nutrient, usually. I see it in a bucket. Yeah, yeah. yeah but, um, uh, well, <clears throat> it's, it's typically a lack of nutrient. could be overwatering. I mean, there are a number of different possibilities, but typically this time of year, you got a rapidly growing plant. Um, you know, fox farm, what kind? Grow big? Yeah, I'm going to be hitting them every, uh, what, week, two weeks with it? It says to, to hit them every other water. Oh, have you been doing it? Yes. And they're still yellow? Yeah. Bump it up. Okay. Bump it up. Yeah, plants using a tremendous amount of nutrient. And if they start getting yellow, that, that's usually, usually what it is. It could be something else. If that doesn't help, if bumping it up, if you don't double what you're doing. Okay. Double the amount, and if that doesn't help, then we'll take it from there. But that's yeah. the first thing I would do with a yellowing plant. Not everybody, like the zucchinis and the other squash are fine. I mean, yeah. That's just spaghetti squash. I just added calcium to mine in mine. It's blooming like this. Sometimes, no she's right, sometimes there's a, we have a calcium deficiency. I mean, we could do a whole well, talk on fertilizers. But you might need another little yeah. drop of calcium. You might need yeah. extra calcium. Uh, the tomatoes. You know how the tomatoes get the brown spot on the fruit on the bottom? Mm -hmm. Sometimes, you know, you look at what the heck is that? It's called blossom end rot. It's a lack of calcium. Yeah. Or irregular watering. Or irregular. And the reason they say irregular watering, it's not so much that there's not calcium in the soil. There may be calcium, but the plant can't absorb it. Yeah. So there's, there's different reasons and things. But to address the question about the lack of pollination on the flowers, the squash can do that too. You'll, <coughs> you'll see flowers and the flower will fall off and there's no fruit. Yeah. Real typical when they first start fruiting right this time of year because you only get one sexed flower. There's a male and a female flower on every squash plant. And this is where the bees come in handy because they go to the male, and then they go to the female, and they're doing the pollinizing. And when the plant first flowers, it all flowers one sex. <laughs> so it's pollinizing the same sex and you're not getting any cross-pollination. Then as the plant matures, you'll get the, the other sexed flower and everything will happen. Again, just a matter of patience. Everybody gets impatient this time of year because the plants are growing rapidly, they're flowering, it's like, where's the fruit after all this work? Oh, the, the, same same squash plant. Plant. <coughs> the same squash plant, one plant, has both sexes. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, it's cool. I mean, uh, every, I, I learned something, I mean, like, that's why, um, uh, honeybees are so important because so many plants are, are are so totally dependent on that that pollination. Unlike corn, corn could care less about bees. Corn is wind pollinated. Yeah. Yeah, I, I take the bellflower. I have my button squash, and they're not really doing so good. I take the melt off the spaghetti squash, the melt off that, and pollinated. Now I have button squash going nuts. Yeah, yeah, you can do that. You can do your own pollinizing if you don't yeah. have a lot of bees around. Yeah. But. And then I started putting night, uh, night blooming jasmine around the outside of my fence. And it's Ooh. Just like bees night so blooming like, jasmine will be great tonight at the full moon yeah. when we go out to the fox and glove the and yeah. do our ceremony. Yeah. <laughs> um, has anybody got any questions? Uh, you got a website? Oh, 
Oh, yeah, yes, we do have a website. It's thegoldengecko.com. Um, I put when we have classes and whatnot on that website. I get the most interaction on our Facebook page, The Golden Gecko. Uh, you'll see us there. And we've got a YouTube channel. Um, what does that mean? Really, for most folks, nothing. I just put it up on YouTube and then I take it from there and put it on the Facebook. Anyway, uh, we, we're all over the place. I'm trying, you know, hey, got to stay modern. We try to do new things. And uh, like this video, this is perfect. And I think these are actually, I think all the groups, garden clubs, I think the Grange groups, any groups that have speakers um, that are talking on particular subjects or the speakers themselves. Uh, we would have filmed ours, but we forgot our um, video chip. So um, <laughs> we're learning. But um, they should film these things because what it allows is, it's, of course, it's nice to have physical bodies and seats. I mean, that's, that's the goal. But a lot of times we can project this out to a lot more people and at least keep them in the family and in the loop so that one day they might go, hey, you know what? That looks like so much fun. I'm going to go down and personally sit down at that table. So I, I think what you're doing with the filming is, is really good. So yeah, thegoldengecko.com. And we're open every day through this uh, summer except Monday. 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 We're taking a day off. Yes. Yeah. All right, so thank you, Grangers and Grangers. Get back to work? Oh, oh. Now we got nothing. Her, you, I. Uh. Oh, thanks for being so. Uh, you guys are